ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय So this is Canto 10, Chapter 15. Chapter is entitled "The Killing of Deinuka, the Ass Demon," Texts 40, 40, 41, 40, 41, 40, 41, 42. Ata talam falam yadan, manusha gata sadva saha. Trinam chapasavas cheru Hatta de nuka kanane Atatala falam la yadam Manusha gata savasaha Trinam chapasavas cheru Atta denuka kanane Atatala falam yadan Manusha gata savasyaha Trinam japasavas cheru Atta denuka kanane then tala of the palm trees falani the fruits adan ate manusha the human beings gata savasya having lost their fear chanam upon the grass cha and pasavaha the animals cheru grazed hatha killed denuka the demon denuka kanane in the forest translation People now felt free to return to the forests where Vedenuka had been killed and without fear they ate the fruits of the palm trees also the cows could now graze freely upon the grass there so there's a very two line one line purport according to the acharyas low class people such as the pulindas ate the fruits of the palm trees but krishna's cowherd boyfriends considered them undesirable since they had been tainted with the blood of the asses text 41 translation 
Then, lotus-eyed Lord Sri Krishna, whose glories are most pious to hear and chant, returned home to Vraj with his elder brother Balaram. Along the way, the cowherd boys, his faithful followers, chanted his glories. Purport, one line. When the glories of Sri Krishna are vibrated, both the speakers and the hearers are purified and become pious. Translation, text 42, and purport. Lord Krishna's hair, powdered with the dust raised by the cows, was decorated with peacock feathers and forest flowers. The Lord glanced charmingly and smiled beautifully, playing upon his flute, while his companions chanted his glories. The gopis, all together, came forward to meet him, their eyes very eager to see him. Purport. Superficially, the gopis were young married girls, and therefore they would naturally be ashamed and fearful of casting loving glances at a beautiful young boy like Sri Krishna. But Sri Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead, and all living beings are his eternal servants. Thus, the gopis, although the most pure-hearted of all great souls, did not hesitate to come forward and satisfy their love-struck eyes by drinking in the sight of beautiful young Krishna. The gopis also relished the sweet sound of his flute and enchantingly fra fragrance of his body. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Teshmai Shi Guruve Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadanti Swampadanti Kam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nittananda Siya Dvaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this is Concluding section of the purport on the killing of the Dainokasura, the ass demon. And that has just been completed. And although the cowherd boys wanted the fruits from the Taliban forest, and that was one of the reasons they contacted Krishna, saying, Krishna and Balaram, these demons headed by Danuk, they have taken over this area of the forest with the best of all fruits. And now, we can't have these fruits, and we really want these fruits. So Krishna wants to satisfy the desires of his eternal associates. And so he immediately went there along with Balaram, and as the story so nicely uh, was what we narrated, the demon was killed along with all his, as the word was you, cohorts, <laughs> his partners in crime. And they were all dispatched very easily by Krishna and Balaram in a very playful way. It wasn't any problem for Krishna. When Krishna does something, it's effortless. And he does it for his own transcendental pleasure. There's no effort in it. Sometimes we have to make arrangements. Now these people in this world make grand arrangements for pleasure. <laughs> Sometimes you hear somebody's getting married. so They uh, spend sometimes years preparing for it. <laughs> and how much money is spent and how much grand arrangements are, are endeavored. And then all that... And the whole thing's over in a few hours, right? <laughs> big arrangement, big ceremony, so many people invited, so much, so much energy, time, effort, finances, so many things. Just for a little bit of satisfaction, and a, a, some kind of satisfaction, you know, to put on something that is, what we say, auspicious or pleasurable. Such effort for such thing, something so insignificant. But yet, when Krishna does something, there's no effort, but it's the most glorious and most happy arrangement. 
these demons were easily killed, and it was done in a very pleasing way. It was fun <laughs> to watch Krishna kill the demons, and Krishna, all the cowherd boys were enjoying the fun. And now, as is explained here, although the cowherd boys did initially approached Krishna for the fruits, now they didn't want them. They became contaminated by the blood of the demons. Just by the touch of the demon's body, these fruits were no longer desirable or even edible. So it became, what we say, untouchable. But at least the demons were killed. And now it goes on to explain that Krishna is being described in a very, what we say, artistic way. Here, the demon is killed and now Krishna is being described. He's decorated with peacock feathers and forest flowers. He's smiling so beautifully. And the, the, he's the sinosaur or the uh, complete absorption of everyone's vision. They can't take their eyes off him. And the verses explain that these cowherd girls, the gopis of Vrindavan, were young married girls. And therefore, from the social convention and from the position of proper chastity, they just dispensed with all these rules and principles and simply were gazing at Krishna like... A person who was mesmerized by the sight of something, they couldn't take their mind or eyes off Krishna. And here the perverse is trying to give us a little bit of understanding what is real attraction. Uh, sometimes we say that uh, Krishna is beautiful, but that's not completely um, what we would say correct, at least from the spiritual perspective, or we should say from the perspective of the absolute reality, Krishna is not, he's described as being beautiful, but actually beauty is Krishna. <laughs> Whatever else we see is a reflection of the original beauty, which is coming from the source itself, Krishna. So when we, we can actually say the word beauty and, sin, and Krishna are synonymous. Real beauty is Krishna and everything else is just a reflection of the reality. And it's still scribed in the same way, but from the absolute point of view, or from the, reality, the real point of view, this is actually beauty, Krishna. And it's described, he's smiling, playing on his flute. And therefore the Acharyas, or of course the Shastras say that the perfect name of God is what? Krishna. God has so many names. He's described according to his qualities, his activities, his relationships with his devotees. So many ways. But the perfect and most all-inclusive of all of the qualities of the Absolute Principle is the word Krishna, or the name Krishna, because it describes what the absolute truth is really. It's attractive to everyone. It's all attractive. <laughs> so that's why Prabhupada would sometimes say, the perfect name for God is Krishna, <laughs> or the complete name for God is Krishna, because he can attract everyone. <laughs> and he is all attractive just by his own existence. <laughs> And devotees know that. Krishna has, or he has many transcendental qualities. But one of the qualities that are foremost is his beauty, his strength, his fame, his knowledge, his wealth, his renunciation. But out of all these qualities, I think as far as the devotees are concerned, we get attracted to his beauty. And that's what, that is called the pleasure of the of the principle of darshan, taking darshan or accepting the principle, the presence of Krishna by absorbing his transcendental beauty. There was one devotee; he, was, he runs one temple in America. 
he was telling me something interesting that um, they had purchased an outfit for the deities. It was actually Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra. It was Jagannath deities. And he's looking at the outfit and he's thinking, this outfit, it's not so nice. Really, it's not it's really much poor in quality and appearance. But anyway, since we purchased it and since we have it, let's put it on the deities anyway. So he was telling this with great enthusiasm. And then after the deities was dressed so nicely with the outfit and decorated, he thought, wow, that outfit looks really beautiful. <laughs> Until it was put on Krishna, he couldn't actually appreciate the beauty of the outfit. But as soon as it was put on the source of all existence and all beauty, the outfit actually became attractive. <laughs> we see that also sometimes. When something is separated from its source, it loses its natural quality. But when it's regained, connected again to its source, it retains its natural beauty, charm, appearance, it becomes attractive also <laughs> when it's connected to Krishna. So here, the gopis, they can't stop looking at Krishna. They're mesmerized, they're gazed. Their gaze is, is fixed on the beautiful form of Krishna. It's described in Brahma Samhita, the beauty of Krishna. He plays on his flute. <laughs> The flute playing of Krishna is, is the expression of Krishna's love for all living entities. What is he doing? He's calling the living entities by the sound of his flute. And that charming flute playing is his love call, we call it. He's calling each and every one of us back to him in loving devotional service. And the devotees respond to that flute call by serving the Lord and by chanting His holy name. And that's the response to the beautiful flute call of Krishna. We want to reciprocate or that by serving the Lord or chanting the glories of the Lord. So Krishna plays on the flute, He smiles. It says His eyebrows are so charming, they're like bows. His eyes are like arrows. <laughs> And, the bow. and it says that in this world, beauty is described in the form of many manifestations of these different features of this world, such as a beautiful scene within nature. But what most people get attracted to the beauty of the opposite sex, what appears to be attractive in that sense. And that element is what keeps the material energy, of what we say, we say people get inspired for material happiness because of the principle of attraction to the opposite sex. But it says that if one simply with all heart and soul meditates on the beautiful eyebrows of Krishna, they lose all attraction to anything in this material world, especially the charms of Cupid. <laughs> So Krishna's transcendental body is designed in such a way as to destroy all material attractions. <laughs> so if we haven't become fully attracted yet, or if we, we might say if we're still attracted to something in this world, in order to find some pleasure in a material way, then we haven't really understood the principle of real attraction, or where, where real beauty and attraction is. And that is in the transcendental form of the, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the gopis cannot stop looking at Krishna and said, in fact, they curse Brahma. Brahma is the creator and he is, the, he is deputed to craft or artistically put together the bodies of the of the forms in this world. And so he makes eyes with eyelids. <laughs> and eyelids are naturally blink. In fact, 
Blinking is done unconsciously. No one even notices they're blinking, but they blink. <laughs> and sometimes other people don't even notice you're blinking while you're blinking. <laughs> it's such a subtle part of your existence. But the gopis are cursing. <laughs> Brahma is saying, you create these eyes, which are very nice, helps, to, gives us the chance to see Krishna. But then you make this mistake. After you make these eyes, you put eyelids, and it just makes our vision interrupted. <laughs> They're serious. It's not just some some nice eulogy that some poet has put together in order to make things sound very fantastic. They're actually feeling like this, that this is a disturbance to our darshan, taking, the, taking in the beautiful form of Krishna's existence. So this is, this is, this is real bhakti. This is, this is full bhakti. And one cannot, even for a Iota, we use that word iota, which is minuscule, minute, totally immeasurable part of a time per period, de deviate their attention away from Krishna. And yet, when, when they came to see Krishna in the forest, when Krishna called them on the flute, they left their homes, they left their husbands, they left their children, they didn't even dress properly. They came running to see Krishna in the middle of the night. And Krishna, as soon as he, they came, he said, what are you doing here? <laughs> You're young, beautiful girls. You have so many family responsibilities. You know, you're going to be ostracized by society. You're going to be cr criticized, vilified. Your reputation is going to be destroyed. Simply by you coming here. But you know, they didn't care. <laughs> they didn't care. All they could, all they could, all their only concern was, as Krishna's calling, we're, and this is a, this is, this is the call of our own heart waiting for Krishna to call us. And so they were running there immediately to see, and Krishna just immediately abandoned them. But they never gave up their love for Krishna, despite and that's, that's the highest principle of bhakti. This is an interesting point, I think, for devotees to understand. That we may, we do, experience difficulties, reverses, disappointments in the execution of our devotional service. Sometimes our desires are not fulfilled. Sometimes, even sometimes you get sick, or you lose something valuable, or even you get killed. <laughs> But devotees never take that as a reason to become less devoted. Of course, we, we say, we sing, not sing, but we chant, we sing also. As lisyava pinaratam punastu mamadarshanam marmahatam karotu vayatatata vavinadatu lampato madpranam nastu saeva naparaha. This is real bhakti. Whatever Krishna does, it doesn't really matter. Still, my, my business is simply to serve him with devotion. It doesn't really matter. Whether I gain materially or lose, even if I lose spiritually, how can you lose spiritually? Well, sometimes it says that, you know, you're trying to make spiritual advancement and you're chanting your rounds and you're doing so many things, but still, you don't feel like you're making any advancement, but still you're engaged in devotional service. Maybe Krishna is just testing you and just seeing what is the quality of your determination in, devo in, in bhakti, whether that's going to carry you through despite how he reciprocates. But Krishna is always reciprocating with his devotees, but sometimes it's not so apparent how he reciprocates. Sometimes he, his reciprocation is that he's purifying us by just by somehow or other keeping himself hidden. And that's actually the mood of real bhakti. A devotee doesn't expect anything from Krishna. <laughs> to expect anything from Krishna or to want 
something from Krishna is what the materialists usually do in their day-to-day -day life in their worship of God. There's a materialistic way to worship God, and that is to worship God for gain, for something. But a devotee wants to worship Krishna just to please Krishna, or because Krishna is so attractive. There's nothing else to do but serve and love Krishna. He's so attractive. What else is there? Because Krishna is the source of all existence. But Krishna always reciprocates. But according to how best the devotee can, what we say, purify their existence. So sometimes Krishna, devote, Krishna sometimes, many times, in fact it's quite current that the devotee is put into difficulties many times in our devotional service. But just like there's a beautiful verse in the, uh, in the 18th chapter of the first canto, I think Naranjan Swami Maharaj, when he was here, he, he recited this verse. And he told a story in relationship to this verse in his own life. It was this verse spoken by Shamak Rish in relationship to when Maharaj Parikshit was cursed by his son Shringi. And when he heard about the curse, how this great king was going to die because of apparent small oversight on the king's part, he forgot to, he didn't honor Shamak Rish properly with some offense of etiquette or some breach of etiquette. But the reaction for that small little oversight or breach of etiquette was he was cursed to die. And Shama Grish thought, this, what kind, of, what kind of son do I have? This powerful king who's respected throughout existence and who is loved and glorified and who is magnanimous in, all, in all, so many ways is being cursed to die just because of this apparent oversight. And he was thinking, the, cur the king should counter-curse or should nullify the curse by his own power, which he had the ability to do. But then he thought, he's just not going to do it. And then he quoted that verse, that a devotee of the Lord, if they're criticized, blasphemed, cursed, vilified, or even killed, they don't react, or they don't take what we say, they don't try to retaliate the perpetrator or the situation. They accept it in such a way as they become purified or they accept it as the mercy of Krishna. So that is the mood of a devotee. Uh, whatever Krishna does or whatever Krishna allows to happen, this is two, th two different things of the same principle. Krishna allows something to happen or he allows something not to happen or he does something. <laughs> And we might say it's all one of the same principle because you can't separate these three, but it's, it's the same feature of the absolute working in different ways. Either he allows something to happen or he doesn't make something happen or he allows something not to happen that we expect that should happen. <laughs> so this, in any case, it is, you know, accepted by the devotee as mercy. Tate nu kampa shusha mikshamanam bujade vakritam vipakam ridvava hupir vidadana maste jiveti om mukti padesha daya bhak. Prabhupada loved to quote this verse. He gave so much emphasis to this verse. He gave so much uh, explanation on this verse in his talks on how a devotee simply accepts reverses as opportunities to offer more prayers and more devotion to the Lord. But what's the greatest calamity? The greatest calamity is explained in the Vishnu Puran. I forgot the Sanskrit. I think I remember some of it. But the actual verse is, what is the greatest anomaly? What is the greatest misfortune? What is the greatest calamity? To forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead for one moment. <laughs> That's, that's explained in that verse. Forgetfulness of Krishna is, compare, is equal to 
the greatest of all calamities. Why? Because the greater the forgetfulness of Krishna is the cause of all difficulties and all problems. And the way to overcome all difficulties, all problems, all all apparent misfortune is simply to remember Krishna. <laughs> simply to remember Krishna. And having the darshan of Krishna, as the, the gopis did, their hearts were attracted, their minds were satisfied. They became absorbed. <laughs> and that's, that is perfection, to become absorbed in devotion to Krishna from becoming absorbed in Krishna. So darshan really, darshan really means to have the opportunity to offer your respects and love to the Supreme Personality of Godhead in such a way that the Lord is pleased by that, by your devotion, and by that pleasure Krishna reveals himself more and more. Krishna was pleased here. The demon had been killed, and now he was back with his cowherd friends. How, 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 how much Krishna likes to play with his friends? <laughs> when, Lord Brahma, when Lord Brahma had stole the calves and, and the cowherd boys and that whole pastime, and finally after Krishna bewildered Brahma, and he manifested more cowherd boys and calves that were exactly like the same ones and he manifested them in his in the exact same features and he manifested each one as Vishnu forms. He did so many things to show Brahma his power and glory as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then Brahma, after being humbled and completely, what we say, belittled and mortified in front of Krishna, started to offer beautiful prayers to Krishna, glorifying the process of devotional service and Krishna's love for his devotees. And Krishna was just sitting there listening to his devotee, Brahma, and he was thinking, this is what it explained, that Krishna was thinking, I can't wait till he's finished with his prayer so I can go back and play with my God. <laughs> he was e eager to, to go back and play with the boys again. <laughs> he simply wanted to go and perform his transcendental pastimes with his lovely devotional service. He wasn't so interested hearing the prayers of Brahma, <laughs> although Brahma was giving his such beautiful prayers. The Lord wanted to satisfy Brahma, so he listened. But in his, in his mind, he was eager to go and again play with his friends. And so this is Krishna. He just loves to be with his devotees in transcendental loving pastimes. And, the, and his charming beauty, his smile, his, let's say, playing on his flute, his beautiful eyes, sharp shake earrings, so his smile. They say, when you describe the beauty of Krishna, they say his body is very beautiful and his face is even more beautiful. But even the most beautiful thing out of all the beauty of Krishna's beauty is his beautiful smile. It just charms the heart of the, of the of existence, and even materialistic people sometimes get a little mercy when they see the form of the deity. They say this is actually very beautiful. Somehow or other, in certain cases, Krishna's beauty even comes through to them. It perf it pierces their ideas of illusion. Just like there was that beautiful story in the Ramanuja Sampradaya where Ramanuja Jari would perform this festival every year and this one man along with his very, very attractive wife would come. And there were many Brahmacharis there and uh, this man, instead of, you know, taking full part in the festival, he would be looking at his wife. I mean, really looking at her, gazing at her. And he was really charmed by her beautiful eyes. And she had beautiful eyes. And the brahmacharis were a little disturbed. And he's coming and he's just gazing at his wife. <laughs> can't be a disturbance, can it? Yes. And anyway, 
So at one point they, they mentioned to Ramanujacharya and he went and he started to, he introduced himself, started talking to the person. And he said, the man actually said, I, I have never seen anything in existence so beautiful as the eyes of my wife. And I just, I'm irresistibly attracted. Ramanujacharya said, if I show you something even more beautiful, would you look at that in the same way? <laughs> he said, I don't think there's anything more beautiful, but since you offered, I accept. So Ramanujacharya took him into the temple and showed him the beautiful deity of Bhardaraj. <laughs> or no, Ranganath. 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 And the... Ramanujacharya just introduced him to the darshan of Ranganath. And when he saw the, the beautiful eyes of Ranganath, he was defeated. <laughs> he became defeated. He no longer accepted that, this, that the beauty of his wife was the best of all beauty. He actually became, and at that point, he surrendered. Him and his wife, they both became devotees. Not only devotees, but rarely fixed up in devotional service just by seeing the beautiful form of Ranganath. I'm sure some of you have taken darshan of Sri Ranganath. Um, I remember when I first went there in the year 2005, I think we went on Yatra with all the devotees here. And we were there and, and uh, they were giving us darshan. And I remember... Uh, we went to, it was, it was a line, so we had to keep moving. And we could stay for a little while. But then I remember after a few minutes we had to move on. But I decided I'm not going to move on. I decided to kind of like just stand on the side. And I was just looking at the deity. And I was thinking, this, this deity is really, really, really beautiful. And I was just, I was really honestly attracted just to take darshan of that deity. And I remember I stood there for more than a half hour just looking at the deity. Half hour is really nothing, but for me it's a lot. <laughs> so then, and then I got a little tiny speck of an understanding of, of the, the glory of Krishna's attractiveness. So we can't actually see unless we are fully in love with Krishna, the, the beauty of Krishna's existence. But Krishna gives us some of that taste in our day-to-day -day darshan. So, this whole particular presentation here is just how beautiful Krishna is and how one cannot resist taking gazing at the beautiful form of the Lord. And it says that, how does it say, the moon becomes beautiful in the, full, in the clear sky. The moon becomes so attractive. A woman becomes beautiful if she has a very qualified husband. Uh, so it, in the Bhagavatam it describes that something becomes beautiful in relationship to something that is actually beautiful. So the devotees of the Lord or everything becomes beautiful or attractive or desirable when it's connected to Krishna. <laughs> it's connected to Krishna. So that is the... Um, all attractiveness of Krishna. Everything is found within Krishna. And for a devotee, we just love to take darshan of his beautiful transcendental form. Especially Sisi Radha Gopinath here. How the devotees here work so, what we say, devotionally to make the deity so attractive. He's already attractive. <laughs> but he gives the opportunity to allow us to serve him and dress him and decorate him in so many ways just to increase the attraction. And that is his mercy. 
And so the devotees are just adding or bringing out by their own bhakti. Bhakti brings out everything. Bhakti makes everything beautiful because bhakti itself is the source of all beauty. Bhakti is so powerful that even Krishna becomes attracted by bhakti. <laughs> Nothing can attract Krishna except bhakti. Krishna was not. Krishna knew about Denukasura in the forest, and he knew about the Taliban trees, and he knew about the fruits. But he didn't do anything. It was only when the cowherd boys came and just said, "We wanted the fruits," then Krishna did, did something. Krishna and Balaram just to please his devotees. Krishna likes to please his devotees and the devotees like to serve and please Krishna. So this is a wonderful uh, little description of the beauty and the charmingness of the Lord. And how the devotee, the gopis gave up everything simply to take darshan of Krishna, simply to serve Krishna. It's described in another time when Krishna was lifting Govardhan Hill, that there was a, a group of younger gopis who had never really had the opportunity to associate with Krishna. But when Krishna had lifted Govardhan Hill, all the residents of Vrindavan came underneath that hill and it says that the younger gopis were simply satisfying. They were having a, a festival. Their eyes were engaged in a festival, just staring or absorbing the beautiful form of Krishna holding up the hill. And Krishna gave that vision for seven full days. He did that to satisfy these, these younger gopi girls who simply wanted to see Krishna. <laughs> That was one of the reasons. Okay. Today also is the appearance of Madhvacharya, uh, the powerful Acharya who is uh, head of the Sampradaya, the Madhva Sampradaya, one of the four authorized Sampradayas. His life, his pastimes, his activities are also nicely described in different ways throughout the Shastras. And there is one book, I believe it's, Prabhupada mentions it in, in one verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I think it's called Madhva Vijaya. It's one Shastra. Prabhupada said, if you want to know the pastimes of Madhvacharya, simply read this one book. It's described there. Madhvacharya was an expansion of the wind god, Vayu. And he was powerful. It says that when he was a young boy playing, his mother would call him and he would simply, wherever he was, he would jump and immediately come to his mother. Even if he was miles away, he could jump, one jump, and there he was. His parents were not so wealthy. They were simple villagers. Uh, his father became indebted one time, and the debt was so huge that he couldn't pay it back. And he was becoming very distressed over not being able to pay this debt. And it was causing the father great anxiety. So little Madhvacharya, he wasn't Madhva to tile. He, his name was Vasudev at the time. Uh, he went back in the back area of the house and there was a tamarind tree there and some of the tamarind seeds had fallen onto the ground so he picked up a whole handful of tamarind seeds and he walked over to his father and said here father you can pay the debt with this and when he handed it to his father all the seeds turned into gold coins <laughs> oh. And his father was very pleased. <laughs> of course, he was amazed also. And so he's described in so many ways. He took sannyas at the age of 13, 12 or 13, I believe. His He was the only son of his parents at the time. 
And he left home, went to study under one spiritual teacher, became attracted and wanted to give up everything. His parents wanted to get him married. But he wasn't interested in that. He had, he had developed a seed of renunciation and he wanted to take the sannyas order of life. So upon the request of his guru, he was obliged to get permission from his parents in order to take that order. But his parents wouldn't give him permission. They refused. They said, you are our only son. How can we do that? This, this is worse than death for us. And so he said, all right, I will stay home. But when you have another child, and when you have another child, then I will again request you. They agreed. Another child was born. He requested again. They said no. <laughs> they reneged on their promise. And then he decided, well, I'm just going to leave anyway. So he left. <laughs> His parents were shocked and they came after him and they followed him. And at one point they realized that he was very serious and he was going to leave them and take the renounced order of life. So his father, I believe in his mother also, they both begged him on their hands and knees, please come back home. And they offered their respects to him. And he said, just see, you are offering your respects to me. That means I am a sannyasi. Because your parents do no, do no, don't offer respects to their children by bowing down in front of their children. <laughs> so this was confirmation. <laughs> so he left and took some yes. <laughs> he was fearless in Shastric uh, knowledge. At that time, the Mayavadi uh, principles were very strong throughout many places of South India. And Mayavads were becoming very, very influential. But Madhvacharya, he would learn the Shastras and he would challenge many of these Mayavadis and defeat them. And, and many of them actually became his followers. One time he was, uh, he was about to debate this one Mayavad who was a real powerful Mayavad. And you usually when you debate you have to quote Shastra. You have to, otherwise your debate has no, no authority, no influence. So he had his whole library full of Shastric books. And so knowing the power of his knowledge, the Mayavadis arranged to steal his books. And they were successful. So he came to the debate without his books, but he had learned the books so perfectly that he was able to quote the books verbatim without even having the books available and he still defeated the Mayavadi. <laughs> so, that's a beautiful story. Uh, of course, the bringing of the beautiful deity of uh, Udupi Krishna, we know that story, how one beautiful, one time one boat was coming from Dwarka and it was near the shore and Madhvacharya is walking there and the boat became what we say it hit a sand barge and became stuck and couldn't move and it was in distress and he saw it and he gave some signals how to get free from the sand barge just by waving his sannyas charter <laughs> and it was successful the boat person was able to get free and came on the shore. He was so happy. He wanted to give something to this sannyasi. But when he offered it, Madhvacharya refused. He refused to take anything. But the man was insistent. You have saved our boat. You have saved our cargo. You have saved our lives. We want to give you something. He said, do you have any gopi chandan aboard? He said, yes. Actually, we have two big blocks that we put on board in order to stabilize the boat on the water. He said, give me those. So they were heavy. They were huge. He said, take it to 30 men to load them on the boat. So Madhvacharya came and 
with one hand he picked up one block, and with the other hand he picked up the other block and just walked away with him. <laughs> he was strong. And then he, he was walking and one of them slipped from his hand. One of the blocks fell. And when it fell, it broke open and inside it was a beautiful deity of Balaram. And he established the temple right at the place where the deity open appeared. And you can go there today. The deity is still there. The beautiful deity of Balaram. It's not far from, from the original Udubi temple there. We took darshan when we came a few years ago. A beautiful, beautiful deity of Lord Balaram. Unfortunately, not too many people go to visit that temple. Everyone comes to the Krishna temple. And that second block came and that, that block also broke open later on and the beautiful deity of Udubi Krishna, and he established that there, it's still there today. And thousands, not only thousands, but sometimes hundreds and thousands of people come to visit that deity. I remember I was there a few years ago. It was actually the end of 2007, the beginning of 2008 I was there. I stayed there for one month. And I was going practically every day just to see the deity. And I, and I was, as I was taking darshan to the deity, I was astonished how much time and how much, what we say, arrangements they wake to worship the deity. It takes them five hours every morning to do the puja to Uddhavi Krishna. And you could watch. They have a little window you gaze through. You, the darshan's a little difficult there because it's just a little window. And you have to like one or two people at a time can look through the window. But when you look, you see the pujari there with the deity doing the various types of pujas and offerings like that. And it goes on for five hours. And so I was going there regularly. And uh, so that deity was established. He's famous throughout all of South India, Uddhavi Krishna. And he manifests his transcendental appearance in different manifestations of his pastimes. He'll, he'll, he'll appear in, in, in his different leelas in different ways just to, to charm the minds of each and every individual who may be attracted to him in one of his many different types of forms. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful deed. So that was established by Madhvachari and it's still worshipped nicely today. So, Madhvacharya also met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and that was before Lord Chaitanya actually appeared. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came back 200 years after the disappearance of Madhvacharya. But he appeared to Madhvacharya and told him that I will take two principles from each of the four sampradayas and two principles from your sampradaya also. And the two principles, and I will establish that as my teachings. And those two principles he took from the Madhva sampradaya was the, the worship of the deity, the Archavigraha Puja, the worship of the deity, and the complete refutation of Mayavad philosophy. <laughs> and you see the, Madhva, the Madhvites are really, really, strong in what we call debate. I remember in 2004 I was at the World Parliament of Religions in Barcelona, Spain and it was a panel of different religious persons and there was like a Christian and I think somebody from Islam there was also another person representing the uh, some Hindu sect, and there was a mudvite on there, <laughs> and this mudvite was agitating everybody. Everybody was there just to present their philosophy, and he was challenging everybody in a debate. He changed the whole forum. <laughs> he just wanted the debate. And he was just making points and he was saying, defeat this point, like that. He was actually a university student who was a full-time Mudvad, Mudvad filer. So I got a little understanding from my own experience. The Mudvites are very active in, in philosophical debates. 
And that's, and especially, they're very, very much eager to challenge any Mayabad philosophers. Lord Chaitanya was also. He took that principle and made it part of our own uh, sampradaya. To not to accept anything in place of the absolute principle of exclusive devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the ultimate goal in life. Nothing less than that. <laughs> okay, so it's already getting quite late. So today is the appearance of Madhvacharya. And uh, so maybe take some time, read about his pastimes and offer some prayers and some devotion to Madhvacharya today especially. On these appearance days and disappearance days of the great Acharyas, we get special mercy from the such personalities that they inspire us in our devotional service when we absorb ourselves in hearing and chanting their glories and their activities. Okay, any comments, questions on anything? Malati? Malati Prabhu, thank you for coming. Welcome to Chaupati, C.C. Radha Gopinath Mandir. Oh, yeah. Is it working? It looks good. <laughs> this one doesn't reach, I don't think. I'll repeat what you say. Hi, So you were mentioning the curse of the gopis on Lord Brahma. And... Um, you were referring to Prikant Maharaj also in your discussion. So in this um, 12th chapter in the first canto, which is the advent of Prikant Maharaj, there is a glorification and also the um, description of his qualities by the great sages. Prikant Maharaj. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so on the 23rd verse... They were comparing him to Yudhisthira and Lord Brahma. He, this is his, and so they were like, by glorifying his different qualities, um, this is just as he's born, you know, the advent. So that's like instilling these qualities into the personality. So they said that he would be forbearing like Lord Brahma and Maharaj Yudhisthira. So he said both of these, according to um, different sources, like um, that they, one was accepted as a grandfather and the other was accepted as a grandfather. So they were both considered as grandfathers. So he would be like the grandfather. So in the purport, um, Srila Prabhupada mentioned how when one takes on a high position of responsibility, they can expect to be criticized, sometimes harshly. And then he gave the example of Lord Brahma being cursed by the gopis. <laughs> so it was a very uh, instructive you know, um, point because sometimes this tendency to criticize, of course we don't know anything about that in Iskon, but you know, in the rest of the world. Never, never happens. Never. No, never happens. Um, <laughs> but we see how this tendency is there. And the example is right there, how the gopis were even criticizing Lord Brahma. <laughs> and he accepted it. <laughs> With forbearance. <laughs> With forbearance. So that's and the other point that this brings to is um, you were mentioning how Lord Brahma he could have, or somebody could have halted that curse. Right. He um, had the power. Well, not Lord Brahma, but Prithimaraj. Yeah. But he didn't. And 
then I got to understand it because of his forbearance right. that was instilled upon him at his advent. Yeah. The quality of forbearance, I guess it's a, forbearance is a, a taking the word tolerance and taking it to a higher level. That you have to really brace yourself for the attack. <laughs> Or when the attack comes, you have to be really ready for, you know, to tolerate it in such a way that for most, you know, tolerance can be done for many people, but forbearance is a higher form of tolerance. So, yeah. And that's what makes a, a personality great. I think that's quoted that the a, a greatness the greatness of a personality is understood by how they're able to tolerate circumstances that were are normally intolerable like so we all know about tolerance but forbearance is there's a real test <laughs> so Therefore, we take inspiration from these personalities. Yeah, and even Lord Brahma had to be cursed. And he didn't do anything wrong, at least apparently. <laughs> Thank you, Malati. Anything else? Anyone else? Okay, thank you for being so forbearing. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Srimad Vacharya ki jai, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srisi Radha Gopinath ji ki jai.